welcome everybody on the call today. Uh, the webinar is how to collaborate with uh, other communities and organizations. And uh, I really hope that you enjoy uh, our time together today. I'm going to start, as we don't have an elder, I'm going to say a couple of words. Um, so I want to acknowledge the Algonquin people on whose land I am right now um, as I give this webinar. Uh, I'd also like to give thanks for the opportunity to create and deliver these resources. Um, and I ask that uh, everyone on this call today and who listens to it later gain the understanding that they need and be inspired by the spirit of collaboration. I also pray that uh, the Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal organizations that listen to this um, learn a better way of working together for the good of the people and uh, that uh, the good of the people remain the focus of our work always. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Isabel Obey. I'm the president and founder of Native Way Training Services. We're an organization who specializes in creating, adapting, and delivering health, fitness, and sport resources. Um, along with this webinar series, we've launched the first Aboriginal Community Warrior Certification, which is an Aboriginal fitness certification uh, with the Everybody Gets to Play Toolkit and Aboriginal Sport Development. Um, we are delivering this across Turtle Island for the, well, the next year and uh, beyond. Um, so I hope that uh, if you have any questions, you can please contact me and I can give you some more information. To put these webinars together, I'd like to acknowledge our partners. Uh, first of all, we have uh, the Leisure Information Network. So if I could uh, invite Agnes Croxford to say a couple words about her organization. Agnes? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm with the Leisure Information Network, and our role in this project was to redevelop the Northern Links website and um, to support these webinars, um, managing the technology. I'll be the one at the end of this session who will give a quick tour of the Northern Links website. If you um, are new and haven't looked at it before, then I encourage you to stay on the line, and we'll do a quick uh, overview of it. I also want to mention at this time that one of the things we're very anxious to do is to collect some of the resources that you may have developed for your own programs. So those might be very simple things like um, a checklist or a, a form that you send home to parents or anything else you've created that you use when you're running recreation programs. It could also be the program itself, if you've got one that's very uh, been successful for you and you're willing to share it. Or it might be some of your um, traditional games. So we're anxious to add those to the Northern Links website. Um, and if you stay on the line, you'll see how to um, contact us right from the site. But uh, otherwise, if any ideas come to you just while we're um, talking today, feel free to type them into the, uh, the chat box. So either tell us what you've got or put in your email address and we'll um, contact you for more information. So I'll look forward to talking to you a little bit later. Isabel? Thank you, Agnes. I'd also like to acknowledge Queen's University, with who uh, we've been partnering on this, and also the Everybody Gets to Play workshops that we delivered across Canada. So if uh, Colin could please say a couple of words and let us know what your role is, that'd be great. Sure. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Colin Bailey, and I'm from Queen's University. So as Isabel mentioned, this uh, evaluation that we're doing for the webinars is a continuation of the Everybody Gets to Play Toolkit workshop evaluation. Uh, if you aren't familiar with the workshop, for the webinar component, we simply want to know if the online format is a good way of providing information. If you did agree to participate, we really appreciate it. And every time that you fill out an evaluation, you have a chance to win a $25 gift uh, certificate. Um, and I'll enter my contact information in the chat area if anyone has any questions. Thank you so much, Colin. And I'd also like to speak for CPRA, for whom I've been working with for uh, the past two years. CPRA pay plays a key role in promoting parks and recreation across Canada with many partners. And uh, they've been uh, excellent at uh, providing the First Nation Inuit and Métis Everybody Gets to Play workshops that we've delivered across Canada, as Colin mentioned. And these webinars are an extension of these, is to build on the resources of the toolkit. Uh, the toolkit is still available. Uh, you can get it through CPRA, or you can uh, download two of the resources off of the Northern Links uh, website as well, and they're for free on the Northern Links. Uh, with the CPRA website, they, there is a cost, but you also get the, uh, the resource uh, CD with it. So that being said, I'd like to begin with the uh, workshop, the webinar. 
but before, we have to acknowledge Jennifer, who's put all this together, and she'll make sure that everything plays uh, according to plan. So Jennifer, if you could say a couple of words. Great. Thanks, Isabel. Um, so uh, my name is Jennifer Pauke, and I'm the host for the, uh, for the technical portion of this webinar. So um, once I'm done speaking, I will just enter my email address in the chat box um, so that if you have any difficulties technically throughout the uh, workshop, you can definitely send me an email, and we'll try to troubleshoot through it. Um, so just a couple ways to make this uh, you know, a fun, interactive session. Um, first and, and foremost, throughout the presentation, there will be uh, a few polls that do come up. Um, you will see these appear on your screen. When these polls do come up, we just ask that you select the response um, that suits you best, um, and, and you'll see that uh, when we go through. Um, also, uh, throughout the presentation, if you should have any questions for Isabel or you'd like to give her an applause, um, you can see a little man icon at the top of your screen. If everybody wants to just click on that right now, you'll see a drop-down menu that gives you a variety of choices. So if everyone could just raise a hand or agree or, you know, slow down any options so that we all know that we're, we're there and, and we've got that option. Perfect. So we're doing it. Great. So again, throughout the presentation, if you need to ask a question, you can raise your hand, or if you'd like to agree or disagree, um, you have that option. Also, um, the chat box, which I think everybody is familiar with from, from this uh, from looking at it, um, is right at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. So throughout the presentation, if you have a question, or at the end, if you have a question, you can select the blank space at the bottom of the chat box. And once you've selected that, it gives you the option to type in. So um, you can go ahead and type in your question or comment. And then once you've uh, completed uh, whatever it is that you want to share, and you can just select the little speaking bubble there, and it'll send it off so that everybody can see it. Um, so during um, your typing, we won't be able to see what you're, you're, you're saying until you push that little button. And then it will also include your name in that so that you don't have to, uh, to put that additionally. So um, right now, all of our phones are muted. And, uh, and if you need to unmute your phone at any point, you can just select the little, mute, or the little phone icon at the top of the screen. And a drop-down menu will give you that option, and you can uh, select that. Or you can make it even easier on your phone and select star six. And that's all for me. Thanks, Isabel. Thanks, Jennifer. So before we get started on today's goals, I just wanted to let you know how we selected the topics of the, the webinar series. So there were a few consultations. Some of them were individual. Some of them were in groups. Uh, with First Nation communities, Aboriginal people across Canada. And uh, so we came up with these topics of the webinars that uh, are part of the series. Uh, this particular one, um, I did a lot of research I, uh, online. I spoke to a few colleagues and also uh, from my own personal experience as well. So I really hope that you enjoy it, and uh, I'd love to get your feedback at the end and, and find out how you feel about it. And if you have any suggestions as well, um, that would be excellent because this is a great opportunity for us to share and to help each other out. So today's goals, we're going to go over the youth fitness guidelines. We're going to define what collaboration is. Uh, we're going to explore some ideas and some models and some guidelines. And we're going to look at risk management and some of the benefits of collaborating with other communities or organizations. So the format of the session, we have the delivery of information uh, with some questions asked through polls. Uh, we'll have an evaluation after the session. We'll also have the open discussion that I just mentioned, where we can actually share some, some tips and, and perhaps even uh, troubleshoot some ideas. And uh, there will be some more poll questions evaluating the exchange. Uh, and then, as Agnes had mentioned as well, there's going to be a brief tour of the Northern Links website and all of its valuable resources. So the Canadian Physical Activity Guidelines recommends that infants age less than one year should be physically active several times daily, particularly through interactive floor-based play. Um, that is definitely beneficial on so many levels uh, for the central nervous system and also for motor pattern development. Uh, toddlers aged one to two years and preschoolers aged three to four years should accumulate at least 180 minutes of physical activity at any intensity spread throughout the day, including variety of activities in different environments, activities that develop movement skills, and progression toward at least 60 minutes of energetic play by five years of age. 
the Canadian Sedentary Behavior Guidelines, zero to four years. For healthy growth and development, caregivers should minimize the time infants aged less than one year, toddlers aged one to two years, and preschoolers aged three to four years spend being sedentary during waking hours. So this includes prolonged sitting or being restrained, like the stroller or the high chair, for more than one hour at a time. For those under two years, screen time, TV, computer, electronic games is not recommended. For children two to four years, screen time should be limited to under one hour per day. The less, the better. So guidelines for children five to 11 years and youth 12 to 17 years. So for health benefits, children aged five to 11 years and youth aged 12 to 17 years should accumulate at least 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity daily. This should include vigorous intensity activity at least three days per week, activities that strengthen muscle and bone at least three days per week. More recommendations. So for health benefits, children aged 5 to 11 years and youth aged 12 to 17 years should minimize the time they spend being sedentary each day. This may be achieved by limit recreational screen time to no more than two hours per day. The lower the levels are associated with additional health benefits. Limit sedentary motorized transport, extended sitting, and time spent indoors throughout the day. Educating our communities and then having them move into action can be challenging under any circumstances. One of the sayings that I love most uh, is that it takes many hands to make light work. So here, for the people who have uh, the computer, you see there's the poll. Please answer. So it says, have you ever collaborated with other communities or organizations before? So everybody can just uh, vote, and then we'll see the results. Okay, so we can move on. And the next question, please rate your general knowledge of collaborating with other communities organizations. So one is, I have a lot of knowledge about collaborating with other community organizations. The next answer is I have some knowledge about collaborating with other communities organizations and I have no knowledge about collaborating with other communities organizations. Excellent. I think everybody's voted. Okay. So as I was saying, one of the things that I love most is many hands make light work. And it's something that accompanies our work perfectly because uh, as we know, when we're working with community, it, it, we have to collaborate. There are so many different aspects that we need to be working with at the same time. So what's the definition of collaboration? Well, according to the Web Dictionary, it's the action of working with someone to produce or create something. It's also something that is, is produced or created in this way. Some of the synonyms, cooperation and contribution. So working with other organizations or communities is not only a smart way to accomplish our goals, it brings Aboriginal communities back to the way things used to be pre-contact where every clan did their part in keep keeping community members healthy, fit, and safe. So currently, as we see in our communities, most organizations tend to be structured vertically. Decisions are made at the top, and people derive their authority from their positions within the hierarchy. The leadership is centralized, the work is mission-driven, and is guided by procedures and statutes. The communication is mostly confined to members of the organization. In contrast, collaborative groups are structured horizontally, so leadership is broadly distributed. So people derive their influence from having their ears to the ground, from being well connected in the community, and from being engaged with many different groups and activities. So the decisions are guided by norms of trust, reciprocity, and communication is more personal, more conversational, more exploratory than in formal settings. Collaborative efforts tend to be loosely structured, highly adaptive, in, and inherently creative. By creating spaces where connections are made, ideas are built upon, and collective knowledge is developed, collaborative teams generate rich opportunities for innovation. When the right people are brought together in a constructive way, and with current information, they're able to create powerful visions and appropriate strategies for change. And we've seen this with the Idle No More movement that's uh, come across Canada and the States. 
By thinking, planning, and working together, the individuals and groups that make a community can accomplish goals that neither could achieve alone. What are the steps to collaboration? Well, the first one is recognizing opportunities for a change. Mobilizing people and resources to create the changes. Developing a vision of long-term change. Seeking support and involvement from diverse and non-traditional partners. Choosing an effective group structure. Building trust among collaborators. And developing learning opportunities for partners. So opportunities for change are created when community workers, organizations, or policy makers initiate collaboration. Sometimes it's a community member or a parent that initiates the change. Others begin when a community becomes aware of an urgent need for change or when funding becomes available to respond to conditions in the community. We've seen this recently with one of the communities that I've been working with as there was an adult who committed suicide because of bullying. So there was a whole new movement of education on healthy workplace that was developed. So mobilizing people and resources to create changes. So before initiating a collaboration, these are the things that you need to know. Who might be willing to join your collaboration? Will the attitudes of the community, departments, the school leaders, and the governing bodies support the partnership? Are the potential partners willing to share their resources and capacities? How do the interests of each potential partner fit into the broader collaboration? How can administrators of specific programs join with other partners in a unified effort? You probably want a broad-based inclusive partnership by creating a cross-section of the community. You want parents, principals, teachers, counselors, other school staff, cultural leaders, healthcare, and human service providers, business and political leaders, staff and administrators from community organizations. It's, we seem to stick to the people that we know, but it's really important if we want to reach more individuals and create a broader change to really get out of our comfort zone and perhaps you know, approach people that we've never thought of before. So make sure that your partners reflect diverse perspectives, experiences, and levels of authority to make sure every interest is represented. It may take time for all of the partners to come on board. Start with what you have and keep others in the know of what you're accomplishing. Sometimes it takes a bit of momentum to engage others to participate. I've seen this happen. Sometimes we just need to start it before because some organizations I, I've found or some projects, they, they've gotten stuck in the, the planning stages and we really need to move forward because things come together as soon as we create that movement. Collaboration focuses on identifying a common purpose and working towards joint decisions. This distinguishes it from other forms of cooperation that may involve shared interests but are not based on a collectively articulated goal or vision. We cannot even begin to agree on how we should act until we have a common definition of the problem, one that reflects an understanding of our own interests, the interests of others, and how the two diverge and converge. As we know, there are so many different ways to accomplish things. So if we can define exactly what our goal is and what the common interest is, then we can actually start moving together in a very harmonious way. You can prepare something before meeting the other collaborators to generate interest and have a baseline to start from. You can invite their input afterwards. And this may save time and provide direction for the group. But you need to understand that what you start with may change drastically once everyone has a say. Once you have your goals determined, brainstorm on how you can get support to accomplish them. So don't be afraid to think outside the box and seek support from local, provincial, and national organizations, some colleges, universities, the private sector, and community members. Collaborative partnerships can be broadly grouped under two headings, either resolving some conflicts or developing a shared vision for the future. In both cases, the process is aimed at carefully defining and, if need be, redefining the issues involved before moving on to solutions. So for collaboration to be effective, it must be democratic and inclusive. 
Hierarchies of any kind can get in the way of sound decision making, just as excluding some individuals or groups with a stake in the issue can derail the process. Now, I've seen this several times in, in my own career where uh, certain organizations excluded other ones because they, were, they saw them as competitive for funding. And history is too far ahead, and there's too many people who are having um, chronic health issues and the suicide rates that are so high. We, we can't entertain these kind of behaviors or thoughts anymore. We really need to be working together. So we need to put aside some of this competitive or the long history of conflict and start working together. So have a collaboration work group meeting about what you want to accomplish and how you want to accomplish it. Decide what system you want to change and how you will go about making the changes. Determine what results you want from working together. Now this can work also as a conflict resolution because at, when we have so many people who are collaborating, what happens sometimes is we get off track and different interests are served. So if you have this written down, then you can always bring the group right back to it and then you can get back on track. So you want to set a goal for each meeting. So determine your desired expected outcomes. What do you want to see changed as a result of your work? Decide who's responsible for what work. Develop a work plan outlining the steps and the person who's accountable. You want to have clear timelines and revisit them often. Desired results must be concrete attainable and measurable. So how will you know when you have achieved your goal? What changes would satisfy you? And what changes do you believe make your effort worthwhile? And this will be, uh, everybody might have a different answer for all of these, but you're going to find more common ground than different ground. So document objectives and goals and revisit at each meeting. This will help you monitor the progress and keep things clear. Desired results must be long-term and sustainable. This is something that I also see very often. Uh, we get funding for a certain project, so we put it together, we make it happen, and then when the funding runs out, it falls apart. It's something that we need to stop. And actually, I'm quite proud of these webinars because they, they're built on the Everybody, get it, Everybody Gets to Play Toolkit. Um, you know, and, and one of the greatest analogies for that, and I heard somebody share it, was when you plant a tree, it keeps growing and growing, but the roots and the trunk are always the same. So the branches change and the leaves change with every season. So I think we need to start looking at our projects and our community work in that view. We need to ask ourselves, what evidence will you see when your goal is reached? One of the key things, we need to build trust among collaborators. So when you're entering into collaboration, this also means you're entering into a relationship with other people and or organizations. So some of the ways you can go about strengthening your relationship is to build trust. We always have to remember we're people dealing with people. The organizations are a structure that we work within. So to build trust, each collaborator will need to discuss their self-interest, what they want to get out of the collaboration, and what will make the collaboration a success for all involved. So trust is built by consistently delivering what you promise to deliver. It stems out of honesty and transparency. Defining and clarifying roles within the collaboration and building a communication plan are also important elements to building the relationship between collaborators. Sometimes you have two organizations who have a similar goal. If you're able to determine who works on what, then you might eliminate some of the conflicts that might arise. Taking the time to create a conflict resolution strategy with steps to resolution can prevent many conflicts from arising or even minimize them quickly. I like to have an elder involved. In my, in my own company, I have a couple of elders that work with us, and, and they're there just to provide guidance when we lose our way or you know, if you know, personal interests sometimes collide. We need to use these resources. So developing learning opportunities. Coming together with people we don't normally work with provides us with a chance to experience different work styles as well as to practice an open mind. And I have to tell you, working nationally, I am confronted with this very often. Sometimes people don't have the same values or don't um, 
have the same goals or just the work styles can, can, can create conflict. So keeping an open mind and, and trying to see things from the other person's perspective is very helpful. Also doing some yoga and taking deep breaths. So there are so many ways to accomplish things. It's important to receive ideas as much as we give them. So we can use these situations to learn skills we may not have developed and see things in a different way. So the challenge of putting collaboration into action raises many practical issues. Where will the partners meet to conduct business? Will one agency's facilities be used, or will meetings rotate among several facilities? Having the meetings rotate is actually a great idea, because what you can do is you can have some free time before every meeting, and whoever is hosting can uh, give an orientation or a tour or just a brief overview of their organization and how they function. Sometimes that actually sparks more collaboration. We need to ask who will attend the meetings, what time of the day or week are most convenient for them. Will childcare be provided? How often will the group meet? Will it meet for the same purpose every time? How long will meetings last? Who will determine the agenda for each meeting? How and when will partners submit agenda items? And we can have different coordinators for different aspects, like for transportation or for you know, budgeting. Um, spreading out the work is always a, a very good idea, because uh, then you know, not there isn't just one person who's overloaded. Will the position of chairperson rotate or remain stable? Who will distribute briefing materials to participants? Who will record and distribute meeting minutes? So establishing a governing structure. Will responsibility be shared equally, or will one partner take the lead? How will decisions be made among partners? Will the task be delegated to subcommittees? If so, which ones? Who will staff subcommittees? And how will topics and members be selected? How can the meeting format best accommodate communication styles and preferences within the community? For example, are informal meetings with refreshments best? So I would suggest when you're about to build um, a collaborating group, I would have these questions ready. You were sent a handout. Have these questions ready and have your own answers um, down as well. And you know, maybe when you're recruiting people, you might want to give a little bit of an outline of what works best for you, and then get their feedback and see how the group would like things to get done. I usually find for myself, the more I prepare, the easier it is to put things together. And even if it changes along the way, which is fine, at least you have a concrete base to leave from. The implementation phase. So the final step of the collaborative process this is when participating collaborators present the project to their communities, organizations, or even the clientele. The parties bring in the support of those who will be implementing the work. The implementation is established. And the project is monitored, and the collaboration is effective. This is probably one of the most important parts. We really need to stay on track. That's where documenting all the meetings, um, you know, having established the timelines and revisiting them are very beneficial, because then we see what we've accomplished. And like I mentioned before, oftentimes what we start out to do may turn into something else. But as long as we're achieving the goal that we set out in the beginning, uh, and we might even achieve more along the way, then we're you know, moving forward and we're establishing uh, a frontier or some, some great work to, to maybe build more branches and, and have more leaves turn over. So collaborative ventures obviously vary a great deal, and not all of them can or want to follow this general framework. Sometimes you just there's a need that presents itself, and you just need to move forward, even if you haven't established everything. But I would recommend that you do uh, visit the guidelines that are in here as, as you go along the way, because then we, be, we can become more effective. Regardless, it's time for a change. So poll number three. How would you rate your community's current level of collaboration with other communities and organizations? So please answer. So for those of you who don't have a screen, we have uh, 
a scale from 1 to 7, 1 being low and 7 being high. And we have 37.5% that are at 3. We have 25% that are at 4, 5%, uh, sorry, 12.5% that are at 5, and 25% that are at 6. So that, that's good news. At least we have 25% who are high. Regardless, it's time for a change. So much will depend on the nature of the endeavor, the number of people or parties involved, the time frame, and the resources at hand when you're building a collaborative group. So the key factors to ensure success are having a clear goal, establishing a good communication and conflict resolution plan. Again, I would strongly advise to have an elder involved. Having a balanced decision-making process and making sure everyone knows what is expected of them and what the timelines are. You also want to be monitoring progress and adjusting to the variables that will present themselves. Building and maintaining respect and trust between collaborators and keeping things pleasant. This is something I want to talk a little bit about because um, when I was doing the uh, consultations with the different participants, when we were talking about this webinar topic, uh, many people mentioned difficulties in working with um, non-Aboriginal organizations. So sometimes there are conflicts of values uh, between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal uh, organizations. And, and it's something that I, I uh, encounter frequently as well. And I often it, try to explain to, to different parties. I grew up in mainstream, so it, it's easy for me to, to work with community, and it's easy for me to work with the non-Aboriginal organizations. And one of the things that I explain to people is that there's a difference in values. And in mainstream, as I mentioned, I grew up in Ottawa, um, what is valued is the results. It's very time-based. Uh, you know, you're looking at the process, want, want to get things done. In communities, what I've noticed is the first value is respect. Things need to be done in a respectful value, in a respectful way for it to, to be pleasant or to be um, efficient. Um, and this, I think, is where a lot of us have an issue because the definition of respect isn't the same in mainstream as it could be in community. Um, and I've spoken to a lot of people about this. And, uh, you know, respect in our communities is not talking over someone, is, uh, you know, allowing the ideas to be, um, to come out and to be expressed and then move on from there, um, you know, which, which doesn't always happen. I find, uh, you know, when I'm working in mainstream, a lot of the times it's, we have to get the ideas out there and sometimes people talk over each other. And, uh, and I've seen some of my colleagues, Aboriginal colleagues, um, shut down after that. So I think we need to, to understand e the differences that are happening between the Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal organizations and um, have a, a spirit of understanding of you know, the different values. And, um, and that goes both ways. I think that we need to educate non-Aboriginal communities on what respect and what's important uh, in the Aboriginal communities. And um, I think that uh, maybe the non-Aboriginal communities uh, or can understand as well that uh, what the definition of respect is. So I think we both have a responsibility of communication here because we need to be working together and we need to, to establish more health in our communities. So I, I hope this will give you uh, some food for thought. So Native Way Training Services wishes you best success in all of your endeavors. If ever you need any help or support with the, anything, um, you can contact me at info at Native Way Training Services. I'm, I'm there to support whether it's a, a paid position or not. Our m mandate is really to help communities and to health. And uh, I do want to mention that the next webinar is April 9th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with the uh, Attawapiskat Elder Joanne Dallaire. She's one of our, our uh, business elders. And she'll be talking about improving our workplace with cultural teachings. So she'll be talking about the seven grandfather or seven grandmother teachings. So it's absolutely not to miss. She's fabulous, and she works with Ryerson University. Um, there is going to be a webinar evaluation. And I'd also like to invite all of you to unmute your lines and perhaps give us some feedback on things that have worked for you in collaborating with other organizations, or if you've got some questions or some challenges that you're facing right now and you'd like to get some feedback. Uh, or if you like the webinar, please let me know. 
And uh, so please unmute your lines, and we'd love to hear from you if you've got anything to add or to, to ask. Please go ahead. Or if anybody's got a joke to tell, <laughs> that would be good. Excuse me. Hi. 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 This is DJ Joseph. Hi, DJ. How are you? I'm good. Um, I was just going to comment on uh, one of the first slides that you were showing that said, um, you know, instead of being stuck in um, planning phases, mm -hmm. just go ahead and move into doing what you're doing Yes. and then see if you can get people on board. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of actually in that process right now where I have a youth group, like it's not, um, we've met uh, steadily every Monday night for the last two years. And I'm just wondering, because I know that there are other groups in El Cibuktuk, like having to do with youth and having to do with like environmental protection and all that. Mm -hmm. And I guess, um, like we're all from, there's one that's just kind of unofficial, it's just a bunch of uh, interested people who are getting together and doing stuff. Mm -hmm. How would I... I guess, and I guess I've I've actually already invited a few to come and and sit on our meeting and just kind of introduce and and stuff like that. But we haven't moved ahead with like a, say um, a tangible project together. Like mm -hmm. I've done, we've done stuff separately. So has the other group. How would we facilitate maybe coming together to actually do something together rather than just yeah. introducing or or getting to know each other, or getting comfortable with each other. Right. So what you did is you started building the relationship, right? You had them introduce. What I would suggest to you is to create an event. You move into action. And it doesn't have to be related to what you want to do later on, but you want to get people um, interacting together in a more active way. And then you can use that as a trampoline for something else. So, uh, you know, I, and I use this example very often because it's a fun one and it works. So, you know, you can have a scavenger hunt, you can have some kind of competition, but have something with movement, especially with youth, to get them excited, because that's what they're looking for. They're looking for fun, they're looking for excitement. So I would suggest that you invite them to some kind of, uh, you know, I, I think I've mentioned, I'm not sure if I w mentioned on the webinars, but the picture race, um, which is a fabulous event. The kids love it, where you take pictures of different locations within a, a defined area. So say it's in the school or, or the rec center or something. So you'll take a picture of different areas in the rec center. You'll print them on a piece of paper. Everybody's got a phone these days or a camera. So you divide them into groups and then have them take pictures in the various areas. But when you're dividing the groups, make sure you have people from your group and the other groups that are intermingled. And then so what that will do is that, that will actually uh, create more of a relationship between them, get the fun going. And then when you're done all that, they have to work together to put together a, um, a PowerPoint presentation and present it to the other groups or even to the community. So what happens, a lot of people have fun. And then they associate that. When they're in a good mood, they're having a good time, they, they will associate that with whatever project you present to them after. So build some momentum, get people excited and having fun, and then present the next step. Okay? But you have to maintain, especially with youth, and I know you know this, DJ, <laughs> when you're, you're dealing with youth, you want to keep it fun. So you always have to have playtime and practical time. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. And I got more ideas like that. Like if ever any of you get stuck or are not sure, give me a call or send me an email, and I'm more than happy. I've got more than enough ideas coming by all the time. So. Nice. Thank you very much. You're welcome, DJ. Let me know how it goes. Send me a picture. <laughs> I will. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <clears throat> Does anybody else have a question, comment? Did you helpful? Okay, so I imagine if anybody else wants to add something, please do so now or, or just put a little chat that you're going to speak. Excellent. 
Okay, as I mentioned, uh, please um, contact me if you have any questions or if you need some assistance or support or ideas with anything. It's uh, more than my pleasure to do so. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about, uh, what DJ mentioned about going ahead, it wasn't a formal group that he's doing and how we need to move into action. My, my personal business, I, I've been funding this out of my own pocket. I did this without any support, right? I knew it needed to get done, and so now things are starting to come together, and it's been two years. So sometimes when we just start that momentum going, then the partners start presenting themselves, and things move forward in a whole different light sometimes. So I do wish you much success in everything that you're doing. I will be um, putting my email on the bottom in the chat room. And um, I hope to hear from you. And I would also invite uh, Agnes to come on board so she can give you a brief sight of the Northern Links. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm just going to wait a moment and let um, people who are planning to leave now have seen the presentation before um, sign off and we'll get started right away on uh, on the tour of the Northern Links website, website. and feel free to mute your line and um, to make comments or ask questions as we go along so first of all um, I want to um, thank the Public Health Agency of Canada, which funded the redevelopment of this site, and um, also to express appreciation to Bert Crowfoot, who uh, provided many of the images that you see on the site. We, uh, we're so grateful to him. Uh, the images are fabulous, and I think they make the site so much more interesting to visit. And um, it's your site. It's a grassroots site. So we're very anxious to hear from you. On almost every page that I show you today, you're going to see a feedback form, form where you can uh, offer uh, suggestions for, for things you'd like to see on here or even um, add, uh, add your own resources that you might have or your program ideas. Uh, if you look down the uh, home page, you'll see that uh, we have a number of items on here. We have a feature location. Um, right now, we're promoting the webinars. Uh, and as the webinars wind down, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll feature other items on there. Um, and I just want to draw your attention to the fact that as the webinars finish, within a day or two, uh, we usually have the recording of the webinar up here. So you can uh, come back and look at it again, or you can um, refer your colleagues to, to watch it. So they'll be there on a permanent basis. Um, also, by looking down the home page, you can see that the latest event, the latest program idea, and latest news, and the most recent resource that were added to the site are listed there. Um, so you can get a sense of how Frequently, the site changes. We have people who are um, adding content to the site just about every day. So there's some pretty frequent changes. Um, we have a news and events section. Um, what you're seeing here is the news. And uh, as I said, we have uh, people changing or adding content um, every day. I have someone who goes through uh, online news sources every day looking for items that would be of interest. Um, we're primarily focusing on what would be of interest to you as someone who works or volunteers in recreation. Um, uh, so that's the kind of thing you'll see both in the news and in the events. Um, less local information and more um, that would be of interest in, in your professional side of things. We have a resource database that has several hundred items in it. And there are a, a couple of ways you can search it. You can search by, um, by keyword. And uh, since today's topic was uh, collaboration, I'm just going to show you what would happen if you uh, looked for joint use agreements. So you have the option to search either for just Aboriginal resources or all resources. And uh, if we search on um, joint use as a topic, 
um, we're going to see a number of um, joint use agreements, uh, sample agreements coming up. For each of these, um, if you click through, you will get either a link out to um, uh, another website or an attachment that you can download. So in this case, you're getting the actual joint use agreement um, from Kirkland Lake. And then you could take that agreement and uh, you could edit it and use it for your own purposes. So we're trying to give you really practical stuff here. The other way to search the database is by topic. Um, wherever there's a little book, if you click on it, you'll see that there are uh, subtopics that are more specific. And if you, you, so you can search on either the main topic or the subtopic. In this case, traditional games is uh, an area that we're trying to focus on. And um, you can see we've got a number of resources here that include some traditional games. Mm -hmm. And just a reminder, uh, if you have a traditional game that you play in your community, we'd love to hear about it. And there's a form right here. Just give us your basic contact information, and we'll get back in touch with you. Similarly, we have a success stories database. This is a database of um, program ideas that, um, that you can build on. And you can search them by keyword. You could look for uh, other organizations by name. Or you could choose the type of facility that you're working in. So I've just put in walking as a, as a possible program type. And here you can see that we've got some examples of walking programs. You'll get a, a fairly detailed description of the program and contact information uh, and a URL if, if there is one. So if you have questions, more questions about that program, you can contact the people listed here. You could ask them all kinds of information about how the program ran and any issues they've had with it. I want to draw your attention to Everybody Gets to Play, because this whole project, um, including the webinars and the website, are connected to Everybody Gets to Play. And um, you can see that CPRA has made available, as uh, Isabel mentioned earlier, a couple of downloads that normally you would have to pay for if you went to the CPRA website. If you paid for it, you would get the CD. But you can download um, the, the supplements right here for free. And that's the only place on the internet that you can do that. So um, uh, I encourage you to do that. The other um, popular resource that we have on here is a listing of funding opportunities. Now, this is by no means a comprehensive list. I wouldn't want you to think that. But when we come across funding opportunities. We put them on here, and we try to monitor them so that if there is a deadline, these items get removed when the deadline's over. Some of them have no specific deadline, but we do keep an eye on them um, and uh, you know, try to make sure that they're up to date and they still exist if they're listed there. So finally, I want to mention to you um, our listserv, the Sharing Circle listserv. And I strongly encourage you to join the listserv. Um, you'll get two things out of it. You'll get notices from us when uh, new items are added to the website. Particularly if we hear about a funding opportunity, we'll let you know about it right away. Um, you'll get updates when uh, the webinar recordings are available. and new resources that we add to the site. And you also can use it as a way to ask for uh, information or help from your colleagues. So you would um, be able to just uh, write a message and send it to the listserv and, um, and ask your colleagues for their expertise or their comments or their thoughts. You won't get overwhelmed with email. Um, as a result of it, and we do not share the contact with anyone. So it's not going to lead to a lot of spam for you. So um, if, are there any questions out there about the site? 
Well, if not, then I'm going to turn it back over to Isabel and just uh, encourage you to visit the site and send us your comments um, whenever you get a chance. Excellent. Thank you so much, Agnes. So I hope that everybody enjoyed the call, and I look forward to seeing you on April 9th for the webinar with uh, Elder Joanne Dallaire. So take good care of yourself, and don't hesitate to contact us if you have any questions or need any support or information. Take care. Bye.